Well, good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you all. Would you stand as we sing Crown Him with Many Crowns? I really appreciate this visual. Thank you for coming. I never thought about kids fighting each other with palm branches on the road to <laughs> Jerusalem. I'll bet it happened. <laughs> so we're happy you're here. And thank you, kids, for bringing the palm branches. Once again, as I said, I'm happy that you're here today. Thank you for being a part of our service today. A few announcements I have, they're, they're in the bulletin. I don't know if I really need to touch base on of them, uh, on all of them, but uh, we will have a CCW and board meeting after church. Uh, something that did not make the bulletin. Uh, I'm very happy, but Grinnell Church invited us to a Good Friday service. There's gonna be a Grinnell Christian at seven o'clock. They've also invited the Montezuma Church, Jackson Church of Christ, and uh, the Paradigm Church, I believe, is the other one, a new church starting up in Grinnell. And so Joel's going to be a part of that uh, service. He's uh, going to do some scripture reading. And uh, so they just, because we used to have the pre-Easter service, they thought they'd, uh, they just wanted to extend the invitation to us. We used to know all the preachers at each church, and we don't like we used to, and we're happy to share Joel with them, so... Uh, that's at 7 o'clock on Friday night. I see here we have the Joy Class meeting on Tuesday night. Uh, next Sunday, we have Brookhaven. For those who would like to join me in, in a service in a town at 9 o'clock. Then what time does our Easter service start next Sunday? 
10, just so everybody knows. So <laughs> 10 o'clock. So uh, you might be planning on a 1030 service normally, but next week, 10 o'clock, no coffee time, no uh, uh, class time, Sunday school class. But for those who'd like to join us, uh, Brookhaven at 9 o'clock. So unless there's any other announcements, we'll turn it over to prayer time for Joel. Uh, just a couple of things before we move into prayer time. Uh, this evening will be Seder Supper at 7 o'clock. And uh, so you guys are all welcome to join us here. And that's an all-church event. And it'll be a special time for us uh, to worship and celebrate uh, what Christ did. And, uh, and if you want to drop off your small children, I know my wife will be watching a small child across the street. And so if you uh, don't think they can make it all the way through a Seder, that's fine. Just send them across the street and uh, then join us for the Seder. And uh, we'll do it that way. <laughs> we did speak about this before I said it. Uh, <laughs> the, the other thing is, uh, is that I'm often here in the office, and I haven't seen many of you there yet, uh, but I would like to. If you'd ever like to stop by, I'm here uh, Monday through Friday and during the days, uh, just kind of regular office hours. If, if you'd like to see me on an evening, uh, after you get off of work, Wednesdays would be a really good day to do that. And so anytime you want to come by and speak with me at the office, I'm here for you. I'm here for that. And so just, just call ahead and, uh, and drop by so I'm not so lonely. Uh, we have things to bring before the Lord in prayer this morning. Uh, first is a list of praises for things that went uh, really well. And uh, so uh, this week, uh, Elaine... Carla, Ryder, and Edie all had successful operations and are getting better, and we just have a praise to lift up to God for that. Um, uh, Craig went in and but did not have a successful operation, and uh, so we're asking uh, that God will help uh, heal his foot all the way and just the wounds there from the previous operation, and so, uh, so that will continue to get better. Nothing went wrong. <laughs> Praise Jesus. <laughs> That's a, what, as, uh, to the degree that I know about the problems you've had with your foot, that's an exceptional praise this morning that we can bring. Um, uh, so we continue to pray for Chris Loss, Chris Losh and his family. Uh, oh, also in the praise list, we have, um, uh, let's see, Edie's friend had a good pathology report this week, and so that was a concern going in, and it came back came back well. Uh, there are those uh, in our congregation that we continue to pray for. Uh, Elaine, Elaine's friend, uh, who has learned of a very severe cancer diagnosis, we're continuing to pray for her. Her name is also Elaine. We continue to pray for Elaine. Also, Debbie Michael, who is also struggling with cancer, had a, had a bad white cell count report this week, and we continue to lift them up in prayer. Uh, last week, I told you that we were praying for Judy's foot, and I was wrong about that. That's Barb's foot that we're still praying for. Uh, we're still continuing to pray that she, she has a wound there that we're asking that, it, that God helps heal that. Uh, it was good enough to bowl on this week for Barb, so uh, must be doing okay. We'll continue to pray there. And then uh, Judy, we're, we're praying for her legs. She had an issue come up with her legs there that we're, we're, uh, we're going to pray for her about. Uh, is there anything else before we go to God in prayer? Go ahead. That's good. That's good. We'll pray for Barb and her family. All right. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, we love you, and uh, we're thankful for the celebration uh, that we got to witness and remember this morning as uh, palm branches were waved and Hosanna lifted up to your name. I thank you for uh, the faith of our children and the way that this church uh, loves these children and cares for them, and, is, uh, and the way that we are teaching them your word and to love you. Dear Heavenly Father, we bring praises before you this week uh, for a number of uh, successful medical procedures. And we just thank you for the way that you worked with the doctors and that you cared after these people to see them through, to give them health, to give them success. 
We pray that you will now give them healing and continue to uh, just bring their life back to normal from that operation. Heavenly Father, we pray for Chris and his family. We pray that you will continue to give them strength and hope. Dear God, we pray for uh, Debbie Michael. We pray for uh, Elaine. We pray for their cancer diagnosis, God. We ask that, uh, we ask that you would heal them. And uh, while we're asking that, we also ask that you will give them strength through their treatment. And we ask that you will give their family peace and hope. Just let them know that you are there and that you, uh, you reign over this world. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we give you praise as we approach Easter. Praise for what your Son did for us. Help, it, help us to remember it. Help us to put it first in our hearts, especially in this season, as we take a time to remember what it is that you have given us and what it is that we should give you in return. Praise your name, amen. As we continue to sing, would you stand up with us again this morning?
First verse of that song brought tears to my eyes, so I really didn't see any need to say anything when they talked about how our Savior was, what he went through to go to the cross. We meet at this time of our service as we gather around the table to remember what Christ did for us. But if I want to go back to the beginning, God had creation. And in all of creation that he created, everything seemed to honor and respect and bow down to God. And then Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness. I'm un- and I'm wondering, what was God thinking? Why does he want to create man? Man was the only entity created that seemed to be given free will. We know the trees will bow down to him, everything else will bow down to him, and yet he creates man. And so I have to ask myself, what is our purpose in God's eyes? Were we, were we created for sport, for entertainment, that he might sit up and gaze down, we go at war with each other? with the sicknesses that plague the earth, with the immorality that's around, I ask myself, why did God create man? He created us for a special purpose. And I don't know if I figured that out yet, what that purpose is, but the purpose must have been worth somebody dying for, his only son, Jesus Christ. That's how important we are to him. So as I think about what our purpose is, we sing a song, you know, I believe that God's the Father, I believe that in Jesus Christ, I believe the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter of what we believe. There's an important question also asked, what is the truth? It doesn't really matter there. Really what comes down to is, What do we choose to do? How do we choose to respond? This thing called life that God created in us, he must have something very terrific to share with us. Something that he wants us to see. Can you imagine a life without turmoil? Just to have nothing there? Yet he's provided that through his son. So as I take the words of life, and I shared this a little bit on the Wednesday night of our soup supper, This is what I kind of put together. I said, life's something that's very important to God. In the beginning, God, the giver of life, offered mankind the breath of life, and in the garden he had the tree of life. And with the other tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God offers us choices in life in which we may have chosen different paths in life, some choosing the life of pleasure rather than the life of God. Christ came as the light of life, the author of life, sharing the words of life, showing us the way of life, feeding us the bread of life, only to become the lamb of life on the cross. He rose on the third day so that we might be offered a promise of life and receive the gift of life with our name written in the book of life, 
So you are offered an invitation today to be buried with him so that you might rise to a new life, so that one day you might receive the crown of life and drink from the river of life, and once again eat from the tree of life with God our Father. Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one enters the Father except through me. So I ask you to choose life, choose Christ, and to choose God. Let's pray. My gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time as we gather around your table that you've offered us eternal life through your Son, your only Son, because of your great love for us. As we take of these emblems, the bread represents your body that was broken and drink of the cup. It represents your blood that was poured out as he became the perfect sacrifice that we might someday know new life with you. I thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Kids, I want to thank you for bringing forward the palm branches this morning. You did an excellent job, and I hope that that memory that you have of doing that will last as long for you as it has for me. I remember getting in a sword fight with Bruce Rushton with those palm branches, and uh, maybe you'll remember that for as long as I do. And since you did such a good job, we're going to kick you out of here. So if you're this tall or shorter, you can go to Kid Zone downstairs and have way more fun than we're going to have up here. This morning, uh, we're going to continue down the road to Jerusalem, and uh, we don't have far to go. We are almost here to the very end of the road that we're going down. Uh, if you remember, we'll retrace our steps here. We started in Perea as they crossed the Jordan River. That's where Jesus taught his disciples. That's where James and John came to Jesus with their requests. We moved on to Jericho. That's where we met Zacchaeus. That's where, Zac that's where Jesus invited our enemies to join us on the road to Jerusalem. Then in Bethany, that's where we heard the story of Mary anointing Jesus' feet and worshiping him pouring out our heart before Jesus, placing him number one. But now we are very close to Jerusalem. The amount of time that elapsed between the, the Bible passage that we read last week and the Bible passage that we are going to read this morning is just a matter of hours, one night's sleep. This morning we're going to learn about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem from Bethany, but before we do, I'd like to tell you a story about a young boy and uh, this is a story that I first heard from Ravi Zacharias. I'd like to share it with you. And now that the kids are gone, we can speak honestly and frankly about uh, what it is that they do. And maybe, uh, maybe by sending them away, we won't give them any ideas for what I'm about to say. Uh, there was a boy who really wanted a bicycle. One without training wheels, maybe a three-speed. He was just really, really wanting a bicycle. And his birthday was coming up. Okay? This boy, even though he really wanted a bicycle and has told his parents, Mom and Dad, I really, really want a bicycle, was starting to get the feeling that maybe he was not going to receive a bicycle for his birthday. You see, he had been doing some snooping around. He saw some boxes up in Mom's closet that were in a shopping bag, right? And they were not nearly big enough to have a bicycle in them. So that's a problem. Starts to get the idea that maybe he won't get what he wants. So he decides he's going to go around Mom and Dad, and he's going to start praying for a bicycle. So he prays, Dear Lord Jesus, please give me a bicycle. Amen. He goes to bed, and, and a couple days pass by, and he still hasn't received a bicycle. He's pretty worried about this, right? Hold on. I prayed. I didn't get a bicycle. And he thought, maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I need to pray better. So uh, not really knowing where to go to learn how to pray better, he turned on the television. He turned into EWTN. Have you ever been to that channel? Okay. And uh, he... He saw a nun there, and she had an eye patch, but she was praying, and um, she prayed, and he learned how to pray from her. So uh, that, that night when he went to bed, he sat down and he said, Almighty and eternal God, if it is in your everlasting will, I would like to get a bicycle, and also if it is in your everlasting will, I would like to get it tomorrow. <laughs> the world without end, amen, right? And, uh, but tomorrow came. He woke up. There was no bicycle. He got a little more nervous. He thought maybe that they didn't know how to pray on EWTN. He went and changed to a different channel. And uh, this channel had a preacher in the middle of a big football stadium. It was full of people. And this guy was, uh, was really into it. And he had a smile all the time. Looks like he painted it on his face, you know. And uh, so, but he watched him pray. And he, he figured out that, well, these guys, they know how to pray. Now I'm going to get my bicycle. He goes upstairs at night to pray, and he says, Dear Jesus, I declare my need for a bicycle, that it should be blue, and that it should be here by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. And I claim this blessing in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. That was his prayer. The next morning came and went, and no bicycle. His mother saw that her son was pretty down. It was starting to affect his spirit. She didn't know exactly why, but she knew that he was having a hard time. So she was watching him extra close. And that's why it made her nervous when uh, in the middle of the afternoon, 
her son was in the living room and she saw his eyes light up. He stood up really fast, like he suddenly had this incredible idea in his head. He goes over to the corner of the room where there's a table and he picks up their figurine, their statue of Mary. And he goes outside, marches outside into the woods. At this point, she is extremely nervous, considering going in after him. He's gone for a couple minutes and he comes back, but there's no statue of Mary. He no longer has Mary. She has went into the woods with her son and she has not come back. She was pretty worried about this, so she was following him pretty closely. She watched as he went, in, went inside, marched up to his room, kneeled next to his bed, and began to pray. And this time he didn't close his eyes. He kept them open, staring intently at the picture of the cross that he had on his wall. And his mother heard him say, Dear Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again... Then you will give me that bicycle. <laughs> Today on the road to Jerusalem from Bethany, we're going to see some people that follow along a similar trail of desperation. Jesus, the morning after Mary anoints his feet, he begins towards Jerusalem. Finally, the confrontation is here. Remember that even the night before, when Mary is anointing Jesus' feet, crowds are gathering outside of the house of Simon the leper. People are here to see Jesus. This excited city, this excited crowd is bustling. And finally, Jesus has arrived in the city where the confrontation is to take place. Not only the city, as we've been talking about, where that is the headquarters of Jesus' enemies, but it's also the city for the crowd who thinks that, okay, if Jesus is really going to start a revolution, if he's really going to do something crazy here, this is the city where it needs to happen. And he's here, and we can start. Now, Jesus does not take the normal road into Jerusalem from Bethany. He does not continue along the Jericho road. It says that uh, Jesus goes to Bethpage. Remember that in between Bethany and Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives. You would have had to go over the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, where the Garden of Gethsemane is, and into Jerusalem. Jesus would come over this hill, the crest at, at uh, sorry, at Bethpage there. And uh, we know that he walked to Bethpage, but at Bethpage, he sits on a donkey's colt and begins to ride into Jerusalem. And that's when the ruckus starts. If you were sitting in Jerusalem looking at Bethpage, this is what it would look like. It's a colorized photo uh, taken pretty early in the 20th century. You kind of get an idea. Now it's uh, obviously much more settled, but you get an idea for where Jesus would be coming from, for what the people of Jerusalem would be looking at as Jesus, his followers, and then this huge bustling crowd come around him as he comes down the hill of the Mount of Olives across the Kidron Valley into Jerusalem. You can imagine how excited they would be to see him approaching Jerusalem, to see him approaching the, the place of this confrontation. But there's another perspective. Think about Jesus, his, his companions, his traveling party, the disciples. Think about them as they come over this hill. The journey that started in Galilee has coming to an end. You can imagine the fear and trembling that they would experience. The same kind that we've talked about. The fear that would come from knowing that in Jerusalem, Jesus likely faces his arrest and death. This is a modern picture of, from the top of Mount of Olives looking down into Jerusalem. Uh, now the west side of the Mount of Olives is a really popular place for graveyards. So you see sarcophaguses, or sarco you'll have to forgive me for not knowing the plural form of sarcophagus, but there are a lot of them. And... Um, and so you can see, looking down this hill into Jerusalem, across the Kidron Valley there. Uh, but it didn't always look like that. This is a picture from early in the 20th century where you can kind of see the wilderness. But you see this hill that is lifted up above Jerusalem, on Jerusalem's east side. It may have looked like this. It would have been an excellent viewpoint for everyone to see. And for Jesus' followers, it would have been terrifying. They would have approached the city directly in front of the temple, which is not just the seat of the Holy of Holies, the chosen dwelling place of God, but for them it would also represent the headquarters of the elite religious establishment that wanted to kill Jesus. 
it's good for us to remember this fear, this trepidation. We've been talking about it for a few weeks now that the disciples are experiencing on this road to Jerusalem. It is the same kind of fear that we experience on the road to Jerusalem as we follow Jesus and prepare to lay down our lives. But for a while, on Palm Sunday, the fear is suspended. We can stop thinking about that for a moment because on the way down from Bethpage to Jerusalem, the party is on, right? The kind of celebration that we saw our kids participate in as they came forward waving palm branches, that's what happens when Jesus enters Jerusalem. It would have been uh, probably startling to Jesus' followers who were expecting Jesus to come to Jerusalem for his arrest, but instead there is a huge crowd of people coming out to praise Jesus. So many modern depictions of the triumphal entry portray Jesus like navigating the streets of Jerusalem. You can see the the History Channel's most recent depiction of Jesus' life will have him uh, coming through the streets of Jerusalem with people uh, waving palm branches, but that's not where it happened. It happened out on the hill above Jerusalem in sight of the whole city. They're out on a hill higher than the elevation of the city of Jerusalem. The whole city could have simply gone outside, looked to the east, and seen Jesus out there. We're going to read the story starting in Matthew 21, in verse 7. This is where the account of the triumphal entry occurs. Actually, it's recorded in all four Gospels. So this is Matthew's account, starting in chapter 21, verse 7. It says, They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the ground, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them out on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I love this story. We see Jesus and his disciples on the road believing, knowing that they're going to face their deaths in Jerusalem. But here in this flash moment, on this one morning for a no more than 30-minute donkey ride from Bethpage to Jerusalem, Jesus receives the kind of praise and adulation that he deserves, that he deserved all along, with a pitch of enthusiasm that belongs to him. But to do this, to feel good about the triumphal entry, and celebrate it requires a bit of forgetfulness on our part. I'm not so sure that it was as sweet of an occasion for Jesus as it is for us when we read about it, when we sing about it. The people coming out to greet Jesus were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Those words are from a psalm. It's Psalm 118. Uh, It would be part of the Jewish celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, this is not the time of year for the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the Feast of Passover. Uh, The Feast of Tabernacles, they would celebrate God's provision for them in the wilderness. But they would also look forward to and anticipate the arrival of a deliverer from God. It was a very nationalistic celebration. This is where Psalm 118 would be read. Psalm 118 gives us these words, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the part that is quoted directly by the people in the triumphal entry, by the crowd. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Now, the question is the word Hosanna. That is not a word in our vernacular. It's not one we use a lot. Uh, A lot of times we think of it as just a a hooray, Hosanna. Hosanna. I'm, I would be okay with us incorporating it to our English language more. I think it would be a fun thing to yell at a basketball game. Uh, and so maybe Randy and I will get the Hosanna chart chant started this winter. We're, okay, you give me a thumbs up there. That's good. And uh, so Hosanna, it's a funny word. Hosanna comes from Psalm 118. We have this phrase here in the beginning of verse 25, Lord, save us. Take those last words, save us, uh, is two words in Hebrew. And when you say them, the word, the sound it makes is Hosanna. The words mean save us please. You have a, the na part at the end is kind of this emphatic particle. And a, it implies an imperative. And so the, the words there mean save us please. And what we have in the word Hosanna is just the transliteration of that sound. 
the sound that has been converted from the Hebrew language into Greek, into English. That's how we get Hosanna. This is the sound. Save us, please. Right? And so that's a little different than we think of it. We think of Hosanna as a hooray, but, is all, but in Psalm 118, it's a request for salvation. Like maybe you'd say it at the basketball game if you were down 20. And you'd say, Hosanna, we're going to need 20 in a hurry. Okay? Um, but for the Jews, it became part of this worship in the Feast of Tabernacles, and it became a refrain together with, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Right? So the, the phrase, Hosanna, save us please, was not separated. It was always together with, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Uh, we have refrains like this in worship today, like next week. I will be on the stage and I will say three words and you will know what four words to say back to me. We do this. The Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the Jews would have said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the, in the name of the Lord. The Lord provides. So it becomes a shout of praise. Okay? And that is what the crowd is screaming to Jesus on the triumphal entry. There's something else interesting is that they come to Jesus with palm branches. Now, in Matthew's account, they're leafy branches. Uh, it is in the Gospel of John, we learn that they are palm branches. That's why we have these, palm branches. That's why we carry these down the aisle today. Um, palm branches are an interesting thing. Uh, first, if you remove yourself from this story, say you've never experienced Palm Sunday before, you would wonder why somebody would be greeted with a tree branch. That is not a normal thing. I don't know if you've ever welcomed somebody to your house that you've been waiting for for a long time or really important, you know, the kind of arrival that you're looking out the living room window and hurry out the driveway when they come, maybe the first time you see your grandkid. Um, but uh, you probably did not think to grab a tree branch on your way out, right? Like if I come over to your house and you come at me with a tree branch, I'm probably going to turn around, okay? It's not a normal thing. Uh, but... Uh, they go out to greet Jesus with palm branches. Palm branch was, signified something very important, especially to the Jewish people in Judea, but also to the larger Greek and Roman world. We get to see it a lot on coins. Uh, so these are coins from uh, Greek and Roman society where you have the palm branch that was a celebration of victory and conquest or peace as a result of that victory and conquest. In fact, in the top left there, that is a coin displaying the um, mythological goddess Nike. And she carries with her a palm branch uh, representing victory. In Judean society, the palm branch was especially tied to Jewish nationality. And uh, in the top left-hand corner there, you have a temple coin from the Maccabean Revolt. So Maccabean, the Maccabean Revolt, about 150, 160 years before Jesus' time, was the last time that the Jews were independent. They threw off the rule of the Seleucid Empire, and they, they ruled themselves under the Maccabean family. And so they printed these coins, and their national sign, their bald eagle, was a palm branch or a palm tree. The text you have on that coin, uh, all it says is a name, uh, Simon Maccabeus, his nickname was the Hammer. Uh, then, uh, again, when Israel revolts against the Romans in AD 66, uh, about more, a little more than 30 years after the time of Jesus, they put palm branches there on the reverse side of their coin. It is, again, it is like their American eagle or like their liberty bell. Uh, it is uh, an intense symbol of Jewish nationality. Uh, here on the right side, you see this is a relief from a synagogue in Gaza. And there you have this, just these three symbols of the Jewish people. You have the menorah, another symbol from the, Mac, from the Maccabean story, the shofar, that's the ram's horn, and then also the palm branch. It would have been for them a very important symbol of the Jewish people, of the Jewish nation. So when we understand those symbols, we will understand the gospel, that's how we learn that the people coming out to worship Jesus at the triumphal entry were confused. They came to worship Jesus as the Lord's Messiah in a nationalistic sense, one who had set them free maybe from their Roman oppressors, maybe from the religious elite who they saw as colluding with their Roman oppressors. They want him to over, overthrow the religious hierarchy, to lead a revolt. In the end, they are in it for themselves. 
The people on the triumphal entry were in it for the Jewish nation. They want Jesus to grant only them, only their people, only their nation, the wishes that they have. They're in it for themselves. They're not praising Jesus. They're praising a fulfillment of their personal desires. The disciples may not have been able to recognize that. Indeed, uh, it's possible the disciples still had uh, visions of Jesus as this kind of savior, this kind of national revolutionary. But Jesus would have known. Jesus would have known what they meant when they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Indeed, in Luke's gospel account of uh, the triumphal entry, we see uh, Jesus doing something strange in the midst of all this praise, in the midst of all this ruckus, where they were so excited to greet him into the city, we learn of Jesus stopping and weeping. He weeps over Jerusalem. He knows that Jerusalem will miss the moment of their visitation by the incarnate God. And indeed, Jesus knows that their city will be leveled no more than 40 years later. No brick left unturned. Jesus weeps over them. On the road to Jerusalem, at the triumphal entry, we learn to praise Jesus, but that is only half of the lesson. The Jews at the triumphal entry got that part right, but there is more. There is another half. So much happens in the next week uh, when Jesus, after Jesus enters Jerusalem. We're really going to fast forward through it here in a matter of minutes, but uh, during that next week, when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and begins teaching, the people of Jerusalem learn that Jesus is not there to fulfill their national desires. They figure out that the person who they thought he was when they invited him into the city, when they gave him all this praise, when they created such an uproar that they could not arrest Jesus because of his popularity, these people learn that Jesus is not there to do what they thought he was there to do. Just as soon as Jesus hits Jerusalem on this day, he clears the temple. On this day, on Palm Sunday, Jesus gets, uh, it reads almost like a fit of rage, but Jesus righteously clears out the temple, clears out the people selling sacrifices and, and helping these people prepare for the Passover. Imagine if we called it Temple Clearing Sunday instead of Palm Sunday. We could do that, right? Because it was the triumphal entry and it was also the clearing of the temple. And instead of giving kids uh, palm branches, we could give them whips and just tell them to knock stuff over. Uh, that would be also an appropriate celebration. But all through this week in Jerusalem, Jesus' teaching to the Jews uh, is in parables about how the Israelites have forsaken God. It would have been a very hard lesson for them to hear. It is about how they have failed to live out God's plan for them. It's a message of rejection, not rebellion, like they're expecting. It's a message of condemnation. Jesus tells them that God will invite others to take their place. He will invite the Gentiles to be his children. We have the parable of the husbandmen, the parable of the great banquet, the cursing of the fig tree, the parable of the good and evil servant, the parable of the ten virgins, all messages in this week that Jesus gives to the people in Jerusalem about God's rejection of them as his only people, as his only chosen nation. Here in this week, when they, uh, when they are so excited about Jesus, when they are ready to get behind this rebellion in Jerusalem, when they are ready to get on Team Jesus and, and overthrow the Romans, they set it up for a tea for him. They ask him about taxes, right? This would be a wonderful opportunity for Jesus to begin the revolution. Jesus is handed a coin, but instead of throwing it on the ground, instead of at least telling them that they shouldn't have to pay taxes or supporting their nationalistic identity or rebellion, Jesus looks at the coin and says, it looks like it's Caesar's. You better give it back. You can just hear the air coming out of their tires. Here in this week, they learn that Jesus is not the Jesus that they praised him to be. Is not the Jesus that they waved, thought they were waving palm branches at. All this leads to and culminates in the same people, the Jews in Jerusalem, just six days later, the same ones, likely, who praised him on his way into the city, standing in Pilate's court, saying to him, crucify him. Shouting so loud, 
and being so assertive about the fact that Jesus must be killed that Pilate, a man who is certainly not convinced of Jesus' guilt, certainly uh, not convinced that he needed to die, gave in to their will, gave in to their wishes. It is a little bit like the young boy that did not get his bicycle. This is the same crowd that had praised him as he descended the Mount of Olives, that praised him as their Jewish leader, the anticipated Jewish king in the line of David. But that's not the king they got. That's not our king. The story of our king is found later in Matthew 27, where we will soon read, starting in verse 27. The story of our king uh, is not one who is anointed on the Mount of Olives on his way into Jerusalem. That is not when our king is crowned. Our king is crowned later in that week. On Friday morning, in Matthew 27, starting in verse 27, it says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. For they put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Our king is not anointed at the triumphal entry. Our king is anointed in the praetorium. This is our king of glory. Our king is not the one that the Jews were bringing palm branches to. His crown did not come from his descent from the Mount of Olives. He was crowned at the cross. Our Savior is none other than the one who was crucified and faced God's wrath on our account. On the road to Jerusalem, on the descent from Bethany to Bethpage into the city of God, we learn to praise Jesus for who he is, not who we want him to be. We learn from the Jews who greeted him with palm branches that we must examine our hearts. We must align our expectations of Jesus, our expectations of our Savior, with what Jesus was really here to do, not what we often want him to do. We have put Jesus in a lot of things in our lives, and to a certain degree, that is a good thing. (laughs) That, That needs to happen. But there is a point to where when Jesus becomes your business plan or diet regimen, that these things, these other wants and these other desires in our lives begin replacing or obstructing the true gospel, what Jesus was really historically here to do, what he was sent from God to provide for us. That is the forgiveness of our sins on the cross. And people see it. There's a 1993 punk rock group called Bad Religion who offered a commentary on this in their song, uh, The American Jesus where they proclaimed, we've got the American Jesus. You can see him on billboards on the interstate. We've got the American Jesus. He helped build the president's estate. He's the farmer's barren fields, the force the army wields, the expression in the faces of starving millions. He's a preacher on TV, the false sincerity, and I'm fearful he's inside of me. Those are their words. It's an outsider's perspective on sometimes what we can turn Jesus into. Sometimes what causes we let take the lead in our worship of Jesus. Some of the things that we place on Jesus as his responsibility. We cannot confuse those things with the gospel. Christ is king on the cross. We ask a lot of things of Jesus. We ask him to cure disease, strengthen our nation, make us victorious, make us wealthy, to keep our families safe to give success to our business plan, to police the morality of our family and school system. We ask him to do those things. We can pray for and ask for these things from God, but Christ is not the king of America. He is not the king of a political party. He is not the king of our business venture or our safety or our wealth. Those things are not the gospel. 
The gospel touches everything. It, it pervades everything we touch, but it all comes from one point, one set of historical events that anchor it, that give it its true meaning. That is the death and resurrection of the incarnate God-man, Jesus Christ. But when we come with our palm branches on the road to Jerusalem, when we join this road to Jerusalem and we offer him praise on his way into the city, we worship the king on the cross, the king of the thorny crown, the sacrificial lamb who, uh, who the Bible says bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. It is by his wounds that we are healed. King Jesus is the king on the cross. There is no separation allowed. There is none other than the one Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I ask you this morning to examine who it is that you have placed your trust in. Who it is that you are worshiping on the road from Bethpage to Jerusalem. If our Savior is the one that saves us from poverty, then we are like the Jews on Palm Sunday. If our, if our Savior is the one that saves us from struggle and misfortune, then we are like the crowd on Palm Sunday. If our Savior is the one who makes our nation victorious, then we are like the crowd on Palm Sunday. If Jesus is the one from whom we expect comfort and consolation all the time without righteous judgment for evil, then we are like the crowd on Palm Sunday. And when we encounter struggles, when things get tough, when those things don't come through, then we will turn our back on him like the crowd on Good Friday. It is only when we bring our palm branches to the cross that we praise Jesus for who he is, for what he really came here to do. On Palm Sunday, we learn to combine our praise for Jesus, our anointing him as king, knowing that our king is the king on the cross. Not the one who came to fill, fulfill what we want, not the one who will always make our life easy, but the Son of God sent to take away our sins. The Son of God sent to suffer on our account, on our behalf, our King is the man of sorrows, the crucified Savior. To help us worship this morning, I would like you to join me in a moment of reflection on the crucifixion of our Savior. I'd like to read a passage from the Bible, and if you feel comfortable doing so, please bow your head and close your eyes and reflect on these words as I read them. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and, he will, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He is calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him were guarding, who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Thank you. Now as the band comes forward uh, with our eyes open and heads up, I'd like, you to read the doc- I'd like to read to you the doxology from one of the earliest Christian testimonies from somebody reflecting on this moment. He does it so well. From the epistle of Diognetus, he says, He himself took on the burden of our iniquities. He gave his own son as a ransom for us. The holy one for transgressors, the blameless one for the wicked, the righteous one for the unrighteous, the incorruptible one for the corruptible, the immortal one for them that are mortal. For what other thing was capable of covering our sins than his righteousness? By what other one was it possible that we, the wicked and ungodly, could be justified than by the only Son of God? O sweet exchange, O unsearchable operation, O benefits surpassing all expectation, that the wickedness of many should be hid in a single righteous one, and that the righteous, righteousness of one could justify many transgressors. I want to tell you happily this morning that this is the na- not the last time that we will celebrate the triumphal entry together. This is not the last time that we will wave palm branches before our Lord. And that is not just a promise that I won't get fired at the board meeting today, later. It is uh, more eschatological or eternal than that. In the book of Revelation, it says this, After I looked up, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down to their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength. Be to our God forever and ever. Amen. One day, because of what happened on the cross, we will all have palm branches in his presence. We will all get to celebrate the triumphal entry together, worshiping not the king of the Jewish revolution, but the king of the cross, the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. I look forward to that day. This morning we'll have a time of invitation. Um, If you would like to publicly respond to Christ in any way in your life, then I invite you to come forward during the song and join me uh, in prayer here in the front. And uh, and up here, we'll just I'll pray with you, and you can share what's on your heart. Please join me in prayer. Dear God, we thank you. We thank you for coming to Jerusalem as our King. We thank you for paying the ultimate price, for being the King of our salvation the King who takes away our transgressions and satisfies God's wrath on our behalf. Thank you for that gift. Help us to remember the price that you paid for it and help us to worship you when we bring our palm branches to praise you, to remember that you're the King of the cross, the King of the thorny crown who paid the price for our sins. Pray this in your name. Amen.
Uh, this morning, uh, you shared a, a, a decision of recommitment, turning your heart to God. Is that right? Please join her in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for, this, uh, for this commitment to turn her heart towards you. We ask for your blessing upon it. May you, may you return her request of love and devotion with the presence of your spirit, with the presence of your voice in her heart. May you enliven that and give her that gift. I pray this in your name. Amen. <laughs> 